Good afternoon and welcome to this Wednesday, February 8th edition of Newsline. I'm Cole Davenport. Today we'll tell you about a new MRI machine headed to Brandon Regional Health Center and about a mumps outbreak in the Brandon Wheat Kings organization. And joining me now from the Weather Center is Colin Lowry. Now Colin, an extreme cold warning is in effect for the Brandon area, but I'm told the frigid temperatures aren't going to last very long. Is there any truth to that? Well, I usually try to be a glass half full kind of guy, but unfortunately the glass is currently half full of ice. Right now it's minus 30 with mainly sunny skies. With the winds gusting up to 39 from the west, it feels more like minus 45. Let the records show that you can't trust winter in Manitoba. I mean, we were supposed to get minus 23 today at the lowest. But I'll have the rest of your details later on in the program. Thanks, Colin. Cops on television will usually yell freeze when they arrest a suspect. But this time, they didn't need to. On Monday, Brandon police officers were checking out a car stuck in a snowbank when they smelled liquor on the breath of the driver. A quick look inside the car turned up balaclavas and two sawed-off shotguns. A 24-year-old Winnipeg man is now cooling his heels in custody, facing numerous charges for weapons and bail violations. The province is providing nearly $3.5 million to the Brandon Regional Health Centre for the purchase of a new MRI machine. The existing scanner is over 10 years old. Last year, it performed over 8,000 scans, and it's beginning to break down. The new machine is larger and faster and is expected to be ready for work this coming summer. The president of Assiniboine Community College is supporting calls to end certain tax cuts and redirect the revenue into post-secondary education. ACC President Mark Frieson was commentating on a new study from the University of Manitoba. It suggests millions could be raised by eliminating some educational tax credits. Frieson says he's met with both the former and new provincial governments in an effort to have some tax credits scrapped and the money used in other areas. And for the first time in almost three generations, Manitobans can say their province has grown faster than the national average. Census data released today shows Manitoba's population grew by around 70,000 people between 2011 and 2016. That's 5.8 percent. The increase pushes the province's population to almost 1.28 million. As for Brandon, Stats Canada says the city has seen a 6.1% increase in population over the past five years, growing to around 49,000 residents. That's up from 46,000 in the 2011 census. Next up, we'll bring you this week's edition of Hometown Heroes, but first, let's take a look at where today's money markets are currently sitting. On today's edition of Hometown Heroes, we take a look at a young man who's looking to try and rediscover his past and his traditions, Dallas Flet Rapash. I went on this field trip um, with uh, my folks and their students and we went to this um, goose camp activity. At that place there was like a circle of people, there was a guy you know, giving sage out to everyone so that you could put it in your face. It makes me feel calm when I'm a part of that sort of thing. I have no idea why, like maybe there's something happening on a spiritual level. My name is Dallas Flett Wapash. I'm a second year student in the Interactive Media Arts program. I've lived in Yorkton, Fox Lake, Red Sucker Lake, Split Lake, Birch River, La Paw, and Brandon. I feel like a lot of the cultural stuff has come from my family. I don't practice that stuff too much simply because like the opportunities aren't there and I don't want to do it wrong if I were to try and do it. If I wanted to fix that problem, I'd have to, you know, find a way to make contact with someone who does practice that here and ask them to, like, teach me their ways. I think culture is very important to, to, to a person's well-being. Uh, we always talk about the medicine wheel and, uh, and those four, there's four uh, components to the medicine wheel and you have to look after those four components. 
it would bring me a sense of pride if you know I one day heard an elder say like, oh, you're such a role model to the rest of our children here. Like they all just want to be like you. I was also taught when when you be like, it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be a flaw. It's, it's just like in life, right? Mm -hmm. It's the it's the culture, it's the spirituality that keep uh, that keeps us uh, grounded, keeps us focused, helps us deal with uh, stress. People don't think much of the last name Flett when they hear it, at least where I live in Birch River. Um, and so I want to sort of break, break free from that cycle and I feel like that's a responsibility I have to make my name successful and to make, you know, the last name Flett mean more. Senate Democrats say the Republican majority is enforcing Senate rules unevenly. Senators during confirmation hearings for President Trump's cabinet appointments have these statements. Reed Binion reports. The senator will take her seat. Senator Steve Daines ordering Senator Elizabeth Warren to sit down during the debate over Attorney General nominee Jeff Sessions. The very rare rebuke following a testy exchange between Warren and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Senators impugn the motives and conduct of our colleague from Alabama. The contention began as Warren was reading from a 1986 letter written by Martin Luther King Jr.'s widow, Coretta Scott King, opposing Sessions' nomination for a federal judgeship. A person who has exhibited so much hostility to the enforcement of those laws. Danes referencing a previous comment by Warren. You stated that a sitting senator is a disgrace to the Department of Justice. That comment, though, was apparently a quotation. So quoting Senator Kennedy calling then a, 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 a nominee Sessions a disgrace is a violation of Senate rules. A short time later, Warren was again interrupted, this time by Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. McConnell determining that Warren had violated a rule against impugning another senator, in this case, Sessions. Warren's appeal of the decision was defeated in a party-line vote. Warren, now barred from speaking on the floor for the rest of the Sessions debate, took to Twitter and discussed her objection in an interview with CNN. I literally cannot be recognized on the floor of the Senate. I have, I have become a non-person. I'm Reed Binion reporting. President Trump's cabinet choices are just one of many controversial moves he's initiated in the last few days. So far, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said he's not willing to change Canada's policies to suit the new American leader. We went around asking ACC, asking people how they feel about the relationship between the two leaders, particularly as Trudeau stands up to Trump. I think it's great that he's standing up against John, Donald Trump. I have no respect for that man at all. The USA will be brown more like a business kind of thing now that Trump's uh, the president instead of Obama. And yeah, I hope that it helps out Canada. We have the Canadian nice guy in, in charge right now and Donald Trump's a meanie and he's a bully. I'm a foreigner, so I really appreciate that he doesn't want to put a, a wall and kick us out. He will put the Canadians uh, as uh, priorities. Just like a Trump's put America first. Now, as far as some of the you know decisions that Trump has made recently, I'm not sure if he's going to go against them or stand up to them or whatever. But I mean, it might if, if it's the will of the Canadian people, he might feel pressured to do it. That's all for news. Colin will join me from the Newsline Weather Center right after this. My name is Mike Lamb, and I am the drive announcer for KX96 and assistant music director. There's a good success rate from ACC. A lot of students end up staying at the first place they work at. It's so hands-on and you got to do radio, TV, camera, journalism, all that stuff. It wasn't just one thing that you're doing. You never know with IMA. It just has so many doors within one course, which is why I think it's great. All right, Colin Lowry joins us once again from our Newsline Weather Center. Colin, earlier we talked about how this cold snap might not be sticking around for too long. What's the outlook on the forecast? Well, according to the readings, it should end within the next couple of days, but we can never be too sure. Currently in Brandon, we're seeing mainly sunny skies, but we're getting falling ice crystals with a temperature of minus 30. However, that's without the wind chill. With the west wind at 26 kilometers per hour, it'll feel more like minus 45. This evening will be slightly overcast with a temperature of minus 21. Wind 25 kilometers per hour from the west gusting up to 41. Wind chill of minus 33. 
Overnight, we'll have a temperature of minus 25 with mainly clear skies and a wind chill of minus 35. Turning to our five-day forecast now, tomorrow we're looking at a few flurries with a high and low of minus 12 and a wind chill of minus 20. Friday, we'll see a mix of sun and cloud with a much more manageable high of minus 4 and a low of minus 10. Turning to the weekend, Saturday, we're expecting to see a mix of sun and cloud with a high of minus 3 and a low of minus 7. And on Sunday, mainly sunny and a high of 0 degrees, with a low of minus 8 overnight. Going into next week, we'll get a high of minus 2 and a low of minus 6 on Monday. It looks like a freezing cold day on the regional forecast. Winnipeg should reach minus 24, and as usual, Portage is slightly warmer at minus 23. Dauphin is looking for a high of minus 22 today. Nipois is getting a little less at minus 23, and Carberry is looking at a frigid minus 27. Clarny is down to minus 23 from yesterday, while Minnedosa and Verdon are both sitting at minus 26. Those are already some pretty cold temperatures, but the average wind chill is even colder at minus 37. Seasonal norms are a high of minus 10 and a low of minus 21, so we're significantly below the average. The record high was plus 3 in 1945, and the record low was minus 36 in 1979. Once again, currently in Brandon, we're seeing mainly sunny skies with a temperature of minus 30 and a west wind at 26 kilometers per hour. But we have an extreme wind chill of minus 45. Cole, it's so cold outside right now in Brandon that we actually did a bit of an experiment earlier this morning. We took some hot water and combined it with a freezing cold day. After tossing it in the air, all we were left with were a few ice crystals. So make sure to bundle up or better yet, just stay indoors. That's unbelievable, but at least there is a hope of some warmer temperatures later this week. Thanks, Colin. Newsline Sports is next. Now turning to sports, the Brandon Wheat Kings have hit a bit of a stumbling block ahead of the Fog Bowl. Yesterday, in a release, the Wheat Kings said that a member of the team has been diagnosed with the mumps. The Wheat Kings and the Western Hockey League are both staying tight-lipped about who has been affected, but reports say that there has, have been at least two positive tests. The outbreak comes at a less than ideal time for the Wheat Kings, who have a game and a half against the Moose Jaw Warriors tonight. As for the Fog Bowl tonight, it'll be a back-to-back -back affair between the Brandon Wheat Kings and the visiting Warriors. The two teams have had a period and a half of hockey on hold since September 25th when the game was cancelled due to excessive fog, now known as the Fog Bowl. Tonight will be the long-awaited makeup game for the two clubs prior to their regularly scheduled meeting with the end of the home opener slated for a 6 o'clock puck drop. Following the end of the first game, the team will, will have 45 minutes to recuperate for the second game, which is scheduled to start at 7.30. And that's all for sports, but before we go, take a look at this. The world's largest gathering of sheep shearers has arrived in New Zealand for the annual World Shearing and Wool Handling Championships. Mark Hathaway reports. Being unloaded into a sports stadium in the middle of Invercargill is a bit different for these sheep. And having the World Shearing and Wool Handling Championships in the South Island is a big first for the Kiwi Shearing Fraternity. Never before have we had, had a venue like this with, with so much seating, so big with the facilities around it, with corporate boxes, and it, it's pretty, pretty amazing. New Zealand are firm favourite in many events, while others, like Japan, are still finding their feet in the shearing scene. We have only 10,000, 15,000 sheep, and uh, yeah, but we still have to shear them. So we started running shearing course. There are six event categories, including traditional glade shearing and wool handling events being judged. Shearers working on a point system where speed, wool quality and the state of the sheep once shorn goes towards a final score. It's the lowest combination, so that the fastest, cleanest shearer will come to the top at the end of the competition. Competitors work their way through a series of rounds with the hope of making the finals here on Saturday night, with organisers expecting a big crowd and a party-like atmosphere. We got a good chance of blowing the roof off, so uh, it's down to us as commentators to get the atmosphere going, but I don't think that's going to be difficult at all, to be honest. All the hard work coming from the athletes and the 4,500 sheep getting what is probably the most unusual trim they'll experience. Mark Hathaway, One News. And that's all we have for you today. On behalf of myself and Colin Lowry, thanks for watching. Join us again tomorrow for Brandon's only television newscast, Newsline, right here on WCG-TV.